Now you can really see it. I had to do that again. <laughs> it's a good way to warm up. Yeah, yeah. the clock. All right. Welcome to the Your Favorite Book Podcast. I'm Mallory. And I'm Tanner. And I was going to say my name first. Well, I... Because I'm the oldest. <laughs> Start but over. thank you for ruining that. No, I'm joking. And today, on today's episode, we read Gideon the Ninth. By Tamsin Murr. Which was my favorite book. I read this for the first time when it came out in 2018, right? 27th. Yo, 2019 is when it came out. 2019. Yeah. Um, I got about 20 minutes into the book and I was like, boring. And I don't know what was wrong with me at the time. <laughs> um, because this book is amazing. Mm -hmm. And it took me a couple of years until I picked it up again. Because I was like, I just need something else to read. Oh, I've never finished Gideon the Ninth. Um, and for some reason, it just didn't work with me back then, the mm -hmm. first time. Um, but I gave it a second shot, and I just fell in love with it. The writing style is so crisp and witty. Mm -hmm. The world building is so magical. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's really cliche, dumb way <laughs> to describe a fantasy, sci-fantasy world. Mm -hmm. um, characters are interesting and unique. I mean, I have nothing but compliments to give this book. I do too. I loved this book. I think it's going to be in my top five favorite books. That's how much I loved it. Yeah. Um, I'm so glad yeah, that you like it. I loved it. Because I knew our first episode was Bonesmith. Mm -hmm. And um, it reminded me so much of Gideon the Ninth in terms of tone and world building. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Mallory, you have to read Gideon the Ninth now. <laughs> and it's been on my TBR for ages. I just never got to it. So I'm so glad that you made me read it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I really loved the sci-fi aspect. I don't usually read sci-fi, but mm -hmm. every time I do, I'm like, this is good. This is fun. Yeah. Um, so I'm glad that I got to read it. And I love the tone. I love the world building. I love the magic system. I love the characters. Like, I have nothing but compliments as well. I, I, I'm having a hard time of thinking of, like, critiques for it because I mm -hmm. just enjoyed it so much. Yeah. Same here. Um, it is a very rare type of book mm -hmm. in a number of ways, which we'll talk about. Um, but before we do, we should talk about like, you know, Tamsin Murr yeah. a bit. Yeah. So I have seen a couple of Tamsin's Murr, Tamsin Murr's books on book talk and stuff. This one is the one I usually see. I hope we're saying her name correctly. I hope so too. I think it's correct, but please correct us if we are pronouncing her name wrong. Yeah. Um, and she's a lesbian author who writes, this book is about lesbian necromancers, so... It's awesome. It's awesome. It's coming from a great source of authenticity, and it's just really great. I loved it. I love Tamsin, mm -hmm. and her writing style is so unique and so fun. Like, yeah. when I was reading this book, I was like, I just want to, like have lunch with her, mm -hmm. with the author. I feel like she would be so much fun and so smart and witty and funny. So <laughs> Yeah, that definitely comes through. Um, her name is so unique, mm -hmm. and maybe that's because she's from New Zealand. I don't know. <laughs> and maybe a part of the charm of her writing style and her world building comes from, you know, her culture and her upbringing. Yeah. Like, maybe a New Zealander would, would read this, and they're like, yeah, every New Zealander <laughs> fantasy book sounds just like this one. Yeah, I'd be Kinda curious like about that. when Harry Potter first came out, and Americans were like, Butterbeer, <gasps> she's such a creative genius. <laughs> you know, um, maybe it has that kind of effect, but I'd be surprised if that's the case. Yeah, it definitely stands out and is very quirky. Yeah. But in a good way. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like, I don't know if this is a fair comparison, um, because... I don't know if everyone likes James Gunn, mm -hmm. but he wrote Guardians of the Galaxy movies and the Suicide Squad remake, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people had tried to have tried to ape his style, yeah, but have struggled to because they're not very strong writers or good storytellers. Yeah, and when people try to pretend to be like someone that they're not, it comes across as really cringy or disingenuine. Mm -hmm. um, disingenuous something like I that I think it's disingenuous this is a book podcast and we don't know how to speak yeah it wouldn't be fair if we it wouldn't be right if we like got all of our words no we correct. have to we have to prove that we are imperfect people yeah because we we know people aspire to be like us yeah yeah our so, two fans we yes our two fans our parents we they, they aspire to be just like us <laughs> yes. so we have to show that we're still human yeah by getting some words wrong 
We should cut all that out. Because <laughs> I've totally lost my train of thought. We were talking about how people try to replicate unique styles and yes. it comes off as disingenuous. Yes, you're right. Um, that is what I was talking about. And uh, Tamsin Murr writes in such a unique voice that I can tell that it has inspired some other authors to try and ape that style. Mm -hmm. And they can't really come close to it. No, I mean, this is coming from her, like we said, genuinely, and it's obviously how she thinks and how she, like, you can feel the author yeah. in the book and in the writing. And for someone to try to replicate that without actually being that funny, it just doesn't work. No, it would be cringy. It's uncomfortable to read. Yeah. Not this, but no, other no. copies. Yeah. Well, I thought I would have loved to, I and mean, I should have done this, but I was listening to the book at 1.7 speed because I was trying to catch up with you. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I wasn't able to finish it, but I got like three quarters of the way through. Mm -hmm. And there were some lines that I just wanted to pull out and read on the podcast, but I didn't because it is so hilarious. Yes. There are actual legitimate laugh out loud moments yes. for me. Yes, I laughed a lot. Yeah. And also... I was listening to the pod to the audiobook as well, and the audiobook narrator is Moira Quirk, and they are an incredible narrator. Yeah. So fun, so much voice, so much acting in the voice. Sometimes you listen to an audiobook and it's like, she walked over to the door, Yeah. she opened it, but Moira Quirk does a great job at embracing the tone between spooky, macabre, scary death, and... Mm -hmm. Humor. Yes. Yeah, that juxtaposition of tone, humor, and horror is so fantastic. It's so delightful. It's perfect. It's so great. Yeah, they fit together like a glove. Yeah, I love loved the tone of this book where you have people being ripped apart and murdered, and the main yeah. character is like, well, at least that lady's hot. Yeah, and putting on her sunglasses and walking <laughs> yeah, away. Yeah, yeah, that I love that moment. Mm -hmm. There were so many moments in this book that I loved, and... Part of why it's so fun is because the main character is so offbeat and Yeah, weird. she's the comedic relief. Uh -huh. The protagonist is your comedic relief. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's rare when you find a book that uses words like friggin'. Yes. Unironically, uh -huh. and it doesn't throw you out of the story. Yeah. Like, it takes such a high level of creativity mm -hmm. and clever writing to be yeah. able to pull that off. Yeah. But she does. It's not cringy. This feels like a really... This might sound like a backhanded compliment. But Getting the Night kind of felt to me like I was reading someone's um, Tumblr fan fiction thing. You yeah. know what I mean? Where it's like they were just unashamedly writing in their own voice. Mm -hmm. um, without like trying to pass it by an editor or from someone who might say, you can't use this word or... Yeah. You know, that. Like, in the first scene, she tries to bribe someone with <laughs> a titty magazine. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. Like, I just loved it. Yeah. I think it's very fun. I, I agree with you that the author is not trying to f fit into a box or fit into, mm -hmm. oh, my book is this, this, and this, just like all these other books. Yeah. She was like, oh, I'm going to write whatever I want, mm -hmm. and I'm going to have fun with it, and I'm... It, there's like a freedom that you can f that I felt when I read it yeah. at least. And that's really appealing too. And we obviously don't know what the intentions of the author was, mm -hmm. but that authenticity, like you said, um, I I felt it while I was reading it. I did too. It felt like she didn't care if I liked the book or not. She's yeah. like, this is the book that I want to write. Yeah. It's got gay les or lesbian necromancers. They're in space. It's a space age fantasy set in a Willy Wonka style horror house. <laughs> yes. Those are the books that I want to read. Yeah. Like I have read the medieval orphan boy leaves his village because his stepfather, who was actually his father, was murdered. And he goes on an adventure to throw a ring into a volcano. Yeah. I've read that book a million times. Like... I want more books like this, please. Yeah. It's it's so fun because you can feel that it's a passion project. Yeah. And it's just so appealing to enjoy. Like yeah. I kind of felt like it just was very intimate almost. Mm -hmm. As a reader, you were like, oh, this is something that Tamsin is very passionate about and enjoyed and carefully created and curated. Definitely. Um It felt super personal. Yeah. Like, you were almost reading straight from her notebook. Like, she'd yeah. been writing the story in her same binder since middle grade. Yep. Um, 
yeah, I just, I just love that. I do too. It's um, great. But you did mention a big reason why that this character, this book is so good is because of the main character, Gideon, mm -hmm. um, who is such a likable main character. Yes. Yes. So much fun. Yeah. From the get go, you're like, oh, oh, okay. I'm on board. Mm -hmm. I'm on board. I want to see what this character journeys through. She's trapped in a place that she's been trying to escape multiple times and she can't ever get out. And you feel for her. You feel for her loneliness and her yearn for adventure. And you're like, oh, I want to see her get that. Yeah. From Just from page one, really, to me. Yeah. And she's got such a fun voice. She's so irreverent and goofy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even though her life is horrible. Yeah. Yeah, it really She always is. has it's very a depressing. sense of humor. And it annoys everybody. Yes. No one thinks she's funny. <laughs> which is also a fun part of her character. Yeah. Yeah. Like... I just loved it. Yeah. So, um, we should probably go over, like, the premise of this book. Yes. Um, so, it's... Here's something that I have a hard time with sci-fi and fantasy. Sci-fi fantasy. There's so much depth to it that it's hard to explain to someone, mm -hmm. almost. So, we will do our best. But it's kind of <laughs> a lot. Like, there's so much world building and so mm -hmm. much intricate stuff in there that... We'll forget stuff. Just read the book and then you'll know what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, it follows Gideon Nav, who is a servant, slave, not quite slave. They call her an indentured servant indentured in the first servant. chapter. Yeah. yeah. And she lives in a world that is like the ninth. It's called the ninth. It's a planet. The ninth house. The ninth house. And there are nine houses in this world. Each house has different aspects to it, different values they stand for, and the ninth is about protecting the tomb and the dead. Mm -hmm. So her whole world, there's skeletons everywhere, there's a whole bunch of old people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and who are basically described as like half alive. Yeah, yeah. Like you kind of yeah. the whole time are like, mm. I don't know if they're like a zombie skeleton or a real person. It was a little vague. But I kind of liked that. I do too. Like the way she described described Crux, mm -hmm. who was her guard, almost made him sound like a Dark Souls boss yeah, to me. Yeah, yeah. I was like, this guy is some creepy monster. I don't know if he's human. Yeah, for the first, those first people, a lot of the people in the ninth with her, I genuinely, I don't know if they were alive mm -hmm. or dead, but I like that. So do I. <laughs> that, um, her home, mm -hmm. the ninth house planet, I don't even know if it has a name. I don't know either. Um, it feels very simultaneously empty but also mm -hmm. very alive yeah like it almost feels like the ninth house there's only like 20 members <laughs> and yeah. the entire planet is just filled with skeletons mm -hmm. and Gideon is like the only living human slave there yeah and her boss her owner I guess is Harrow Hawk Nona Jesimus yes and she's the reverend daughter which is like the heir to the ninth house and um, she's the only one on the planet who I think has necromancy powers. Yes. Yeah. She's the only necromancer. Yeah. And her, her abilities are to just control skeletons. Yes. It's like she has like bone studs in her ear. She takes them off and she can make them come to life. Yeah. She has the ability to create full skeletons from super, super small pieces of bone, yeah. which is. And then control the skeletons. Yeah. Yeah. With super powers. Yeah. She's very. She has a lot of control and a lot of power. Not a lot of people can make as much skeletons from as little bone and make as much accurate, complete, working skeletons from much, as much bone. Yeah. Um, but at the beginning of this book, we don't really know why Gideon is enslaved. Yeah. Um, we just know that she's trying to escape. And Harrowhawk, who is close to the same age as her, um, treats her like, like crap. crap. Like Treats garbage. her horribly. Mm -hmm. Um and Gideon has been trying for so long to escape and join the military. Yeah. Because the only thing that she knows is how to wield her two-handed longsword. Mm -hmm. um, and she just wants to get off this planet and live her own life. Yeah. So she has this escape plan. It's going really, really well until Harrowhark catches her. They make a deal. Harrowhark is like, okay, hey, battle me in a duel. If you win, you can leave. If I win, 
you can leave, but you also owe me five years of service. Well, she says you have to attend this meeting. Oh, yes. Because she calls a house meeting for everyone to come because there's some kind of yes. big deal going on. And Gideon thinks, you call the house meeting for me because I'm trying to escape? <laughs> she says, no, not everything's about you. And their banter is so great. It's next level. It really is. It is so fantastic. So, um, Harahawk and Gideon, they have this wager. Mm -hmm. They fight, and Harahawk set a trap for Gideon. Um, Gideon loses, and so, horribly. Yes. Um, Harahawk, like, buried all these bones underneath the ground and brought them to life. Gideon didn't expect that. And all the skeletons just drug her underground, basically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then Harrowhawk. Harrowhark. Harrowhawk. Hawk, right? Really? I thought it was Harrowhark. Oh. I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Yeah. This is good audio. This is really great content. Yeah, whatever. We can we can say it with an accent. Harrowhawk. Harrowhawk. <laughs> um, uh, getting his grabbed by all the skeletons that Harrowhawk sent after her, mm -hmm. and then she kicks her in the face, says that she absolutely absolutely hates her. Mm -hmm. So this relationship starts off in a really good place. Yes, it, it's <laughs> fantastic. You, From the get-go, you see, obviously, Gideon has spent her whole entire life being severely bullied and traumatized by mm -hmm. Harrowhawk. Yeah, and they both absolutely hate each other. Mm -hmm. We don't really know why Harrowhawk hates Gideon, but she just does. Yeah. Like, I I assumed it's just because it was like, oh, next in heir versus indentured servant, they have to hate each other. Mm -hmm. Like, that's kind of the common reason. Yeah. But. I think what we interpret at this point is that uh, Harrowhawk just enjoys torturing Gideon. Yeah. Like, she's a sadist. Yes. That's all the information that we get. Yeah. Um, but I think there are, in this first chapter, hints towards something that Gideon knows that she can use as blackmail against Harrowhawk. Mm -hmm. And we don't know what that is. Yes. And this book is dense with information. Mm -hmm. Like, there are so many characters, there's so much world building, there's a lot of interesting backstory stuff between Gideon, Harrowhawk, mm -hmm. and the Ninth House. Yeah. And Harrowhawk's parents. Mm -hmm. um, and at the beginning of the book, we get a cast of characters in order of appearance, which... As a theater girly, I loved. Yeah. But even just that cast list with descriptions is still, like... Overwhelming. So much stuff. And how do you pronounce those names if you don't have the audiobook? I listened... <laughs> I tried to read it on my Kindle, and I was like, nope, audiobook, 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 audiobook. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I only had the audiobook. Mm -hmm. um, so I just pronounce them the way that they're pronounced in the audiobook. Mm -hmm. And the names are wonderful. Yes. They're so good and musical. Mm -hmm. She just has a special knack for that. Yeah, I they're think. so great. I loved all of them. And yeah. Yeah, they're fun. They're definitely hard to pronounce if you're just reading it. So I'm yes. glad I listened to the audiobook. It's nice to have a pronunciation mm -hmm. uh, guide in yeah. a way. But the book is so dense that I think it's, it, it's better on a second or a third listen. Yeah. I listened to it. For the third time, I didn't finish it quite yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I loved just, like, piecing together all the different things that... You missed the first time around. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Without giving anything away. Yes. But um, it makes it so much better. And there are so many characters that when I first listened to this, I kept on rewinding. So I'm like, okay, who's speaking here? What house do they belong to? Yeah. So I can see how that might be a bit of a drawback, especially for someone who's trying to listen to this book for the first time mm -hmm. and they don't love it right away. Mm -hmm. But for me, I loved that. I, I liked that depth as well because all of the characters, I really loved all of the characters. Me but too. It's a big cast. If it's you big. aren't enjoying it as much as we enjoyed it, I can definitely see how it's a little cluttered. It could be cluttered. I, I yeah. loved everybody. But so did I. It did get easier after multiple people got killed off. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because you get to know everybody And more. honestly, mechanically, that kind of works in favor of the book. Yeah, it does. Um, the difficult thing is that she kills off all the characters that you like first. <laughs> yes. It's heartbreaking. Uh, it is. Um, and I don't know. It's so well done. Wow. I'm really get, no, doing a good fine. job. She, she does such a great job at giving you piece by piece by piece of information just enough to make you go, oh, wait, but, what, but then what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Like, really 
pulls the reader along with this mystery slowly being solved and unraveled and it's very fun as a reader to figure yeah. it out with the characters. Yeah. So the basic premise of the book, I know that we said that we were going to talk about this, <laughs> but Harrowhawk and Gideon both have to travel to the planet of the first house, mm -hmm. which is like an abandoned planet to become so that Harrowhawk can become a lictor. Mm -hmm. And Gideon has to come with her because there's a tradition observed with all the houses that a necromancer must have a cavalier, it's a like bodyguard. Their bodyguard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, the bodyguard of the ninth house is horribly unqualified, totally babied, and um, they die. Yeah. But Gideon doesn't know that at the beginning of the book. Mm -hmm. So that's a bit of a spoiler. Spoilers, by the way. <laughs> Lots of spoilers. If you really want to read this book, you should read it before listening to this podcast. Because yes. there are so many reveals that would honestly, I think, ruin the book. Oh, yeah, for sure. If you found out about them before reading. Yes, you definitely should read the book first before listening to this episode. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's what she does best is writing a compelling mystery. Yes. In more than more than one way. Mm -hmm. Like there's mysteries about um, Gideon's origin. I know I said that I get bored of stories about orphans, but she's an orphan and yes. I love this book. Yes. Um, there's a mystery between the relationship of Harrowhawk and Gideon, mm -hmm. their backstory. And there's mysteries between all the rest of the children their age that got, that were killed when they were yeah. young. There's mysteries about the first house planet that they're in. There's mysteries about, like, there's yeah. so many and they are all perfectly woven into this beautiful tapestry. Yes. And revealed at a pace that isn't overwhelming. Yeah. Either. It's yeah. It's like super satisfying. Mm -hmm. Like, for me, I don't know how it was for you, but there wasn't a moment in this book that lingered. No, I agree. I didn't feel that way either. It okay. was paced really, really efficiently and... As a reader, as soon as, like I said, as soon as you would get a reveal, you'd be like, oh, that makes sense. Oh, but the implications complicate this other thing. So I got to keep reading to try yeah. to figure out how that finishes up. Yeah. It's fantastic. It's one of those books that you could read it and fall in love with it and not realize just how difficult it is to do what she's doing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like she is juggling so many plates mm -hmm. and she does it deftly yeah. from beginning to end. I mean... We're just showering this with compliments, but it deserves it. Was it was so good. It's an excellent story. Yeah, I really loved it. Yeah. Um, the murder mystery aspect of this story doesn't begin until about halfway through. Yes. And that's when it becomes like an, a typical fantasy adventure mm -hmm. to like a clue style um, murder mystery whodunit type story. Yeah. It was very fun. I was not expecting that. Yeah. I... From the get-go, you kind of get some weird vibes from the first house, but none of it is, like, aggressive or... Mm -hmm. It's, like, neutral weird vibes instead of yeah. negative weird vibes. It feels like he, they're walking into a haunted house. Yeah, and yeah. And there's only, like, a few priests there mm -hmm. who are alive, who are, like, taking care of this decrepit ancient building yeah. for some reason. We don't know why the first house has been abandoned mm -hmm. at this point, but... All other houses from 2nd to ninth are present there. Yeah, with living people. Yes. And, yeah. So there's, like, six other necromancers, right? Um, other than Gideon? There, I'm sorry, other than Harrowhawk? There are seven others. What's the math? Two through eight plus Gideon. So there's seven besides Harrowhawk. I know I'm mixing this up. <laughs> there's eight necromancers. <laughs> Yes. Who are trying to become lictors. Yes. And each of them have their own cavalier. Mm -hmm. And all of these houses, from the beginning, we get a short rundown of what each house values. And yeah. all of these characters are so unique mm -hmm. and really embody their house or ironically embody the house's values, yeah. um, which is really fun. And each of them have cavaliers, which are also so unique and fleshed out as characters. Like, mm -hmm. it's really fun. Even these side characters that you get a glimpse of, you can be like, oh, I know exactly what kind of person that is, Yeah, which is super fun. And all of these necromancers and cavaliers have been called to the first house to try to find out how to become lictors. And it's is, not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. Lictor is kind of like a demigod status, I think is yeah. an equivalent that could be made. Yeah, that's, yeah. You become more immortal. Yeah, it's um, like... 
I don't know if, I don't know when that's revealed. Like if that's early in the book. I think it's early in the book because they're like, oh, these lictors have been alive for thousands of years. The original ones. But there is still quite a bit of mystery surrounding what that title is or entails. Mm -hmm. We just know that that's what everyone has come to this house to become. Yeah. Um, And it's some grand enviable thing Mm -hmm. because the previous lictors, as you said, have been alive for thousands of years. And so being called to become a new one hasn't happened for generations. Yeah. So, of course, Harrowhawk and all these other necromancers are going to leap on this opportunity Mm -hmm. to bring honor and glory to their house, to bring honor and glory to themselves. Yeah. But they all have their own motivations for why they're doing it. Mm -hmm. But the brilliant thing about this plot structure is that even though there's a lot of characters... They have their own motivations. They're all trying to achieve the same goal. Yes. And it's fun to see that and see the different ways that each pairing tries to complete those goals. Yeah. Like there are some people that are like, oh, let's work together. And other people that are like, I would rather die than work with any of you. Like Harrowhawk. Yes. Harrowhawk is one of those. Including my own cavalier. Yes. And I really liked this setup when the priests are like, you're here to become lictors. The only rule is you can't enter a door without permission. Like, you can't enter a locked room without permission. That's the only rule. And that wording is very specific. Mm -hmm. And I also liked what he said about how if your cavalier is found wanting, then the necromancer is not good enough. If the necromancer is found wanting, then the cavalier is not good enough. Yeah. If you're both found wanting, then you shouldn't be here. There's all these juicy, delicious hints. I'm glad you remember that. So fantastic. I just loved... The verbiage is so specific and fantastic. Yeah, it's really, really good. Mm -hmm. Um, Just to touch briefly on her writing style again, you can feel that like in the first few chapters, she's kind of flexing her abilities. Yeah. And she's extremely talented. Mm -hmm. And then as the story like ramps up, that kind of falls back a bit. Yeah. But I think it's a good thing because... I, while I did love her writing style in the first three chapters, I think maybe part of the reason why I didn't fall in love with it at first is because it kind of felt like a bit too much style and not enough substance. Yeah, I can understand that. When I was listening to the first chapters, I was a little confused at first. Yeah. Like, it was a little bit difficult to follow in the beginning. Yeah. Um, and I think it's because of that. Um, it just was... So many, it, it was like so many clever turns of phrase. It was almost like you show up for a buffet and the only meal they have to serve is cake. Yeah. But the cake, the cake is amazing. Yes. Yes. But it's like, I would like some protein, please. Yes. <laughs> you know, and then she delivers on that front as well, mm-hmm. which I think is in service of the narrative. It's like, let's pull back on some of the fancy prose, um, which is really good, mm-hmm. but sprinkle it throughout a really good story. Yeah. Um, and she shows that she's just as good at that, too. Yeah, it's crazy to me. It's yeah. incredible. I think, like, I really look up to her as a writer and I a storyteller. Too. It's, it's one just... of those stories where you, like, read it and you're like, I'll never be able to make anything this good. No, I agree. <laughs> yeah. I agree. Oh, my gosh, it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so these people are here to try to solve how to become a lictor. And in the beginning, Harrowhark literally tells Gideon, so each... Um, Cavalier gets a metal bracelet with a bar on it, Mm -hmm. which we later learn is a key. And Harold Hark, while Gideon's asleep, steals this and leaves a note that says, I took the key. Don't talk to anyone. You idiot. You are so stupid. (laughs) Literally, don't open your mouth to the the door. Like, don't. Mm -hmm. Don't bother finding me. Don't mess with anything. Don't make a scene. And Gideon's like... I hate you, Harold (laughs) Yeah. I hate that I'm stuck here and I have to do this. Yeah. And I love that Harold Hark's like... She keeps on picking up notes. Like, Harrowhawk knows exactly where Gideon is going to go first when she wakes up. Mm -hmm. It's like, there's a note by her bed. There's a note by the nightstand. There's a note by the door. And she, like, defines terms like, by anyone. I mean, anyone living or dead with or without this castle, you know? Yes. Like, it's so specific and charming and funny. Uh Uh-huh. Like, you you get a sense of how deeply Gideon and Hera Hark know each other. Yeah. Even though they hate each other. Yeah. Which is very fun. And Gideon has goes about and starts exploring and trying to find stuff. And, and she does listen to Hera Hawk. Yeah, she does. And in the ninth house, the cavalier usually is a nun and the nuns take a vow of silence. Mm-hmm. So for a lot of this story, Gideon can't speak. And it's fun. Chooses not yeah, to. Yeah, she chooses, she chooses not to. Someone's like, 
the first person is like, oh, I know you take a vow of silence, great, feared person. Mm -hmm. May I sit with you? And it's fun to see yeah. how much information Gideon can pick up when she's not speaking at all. Yeah, she's basically a silent protagonist for the beginning of the second act, mm -hmm. much of the second act. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't also doesn't pull you out of the story either. It's yeah. just as fascinating like having this story being told from her perspective while she's exploring the castle and having interactions with these other houses mm -hmm. who treat her like she's some intimidating silent nun who's this gigantic towering muscular woman. Yes. <laughs> which is awesome. Uh -huh. um, meanwhile, Gideon's personality is so much more playful, light, and relaxed. Yeah. But she enjoys seeing how other people react to her because there's some reputation that the ninth house holds among the other houses that she's unaware of. Mm -hmm. And people treat her either with deference and respect and fear mm -hmm. or they completely hate her guts, mm -hmm. like the eighth house. Yeah. Um, but I love, I love that dynamic of like, I know who Gideon's like. And if she talked out loud to any of these people, she would most likely offend all of them. Yes, yes. She's like, big, strong woman. But in her yeah. head, she's like, man, these guys are just... Weirdos it's and dorks. It's so fun. It's so enjoyable. The reason why, I don't know if we mentioned this, the reason why she has a vow of silence is because Gideon knows that she can't pretend to be a cavalier. Mm -hmm. And if anyone finds out that she isn't, then Harrowhawk is worried that they might be disqualified from trying to become lictors. Yeah. So Harrowhawk stresses that point upon her mm -hmm. greatly and says, after I'm done becoming a lictor, the deal is that I'll let you go. Mm -hmm. So that's why Gideon is Gideon. willing to listen to Harrowhawk yeah. and has to remain silent. Yeah. Because it's, it's the best strategy to, you know, for both keep themselves them. hidden. Yeah. 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 It's great. They both have invested interest in this for different reasons. And it puts a lot of tension on their relationship because Harrowhawk is like, oh, I'm so scared Gideon's going to mess up. I mm -hmm. hate you. And Gideon is like, I just want to be free. So I have to obey and follow the rules. Even though I hate Harrowhawk. Yes. And following the rules. And I hate following the rules. Yeah. She hates both things. Yeah. Um, Harrowhawk, as is going around trying to solve this mystery without Gideon. And we have no clue what she's doing. Yeah. She's like gone. She only, Gideon only ever sees her sometimes when she's asleep. Mm -hmm. And... Or she sees evidence of her, like... Like laundry being yeah. moved or tossed on the bed. Or... So she's like, she's alive, but I don't care what she's doing. Mm -hmm. Until she isn't anymore. Mm -hmm. Kideon notices that the laundry hasn't been moved in 24 hours and the bed is in the same state it was the day before. So Gideon's like, well... Fine. <laughs> either Harrowhawk is dead, which would be good because I hate her, mm -hmm. or Harrowhawk has been abducted, or like... The writing is so fun. She's like, there's three scenarios here. Mm -hmm. And Gideon works through all of them and then is like, okay, fine. I'll go look for her. I have no other choice. Yeah. I have to keep this person whom I hate alive. Yeah. And she goes and find, goes and looks for her and runs into another set of Cavalier and Necromancer in this like kind of hard to access part of the castle. Yeah. And the way she describes the castle is so unique. It's so it's, visual. It's it's so it's so interesting. Yeah. I've said that word like 10 times, but it's just <laughs> fascinating to read and understand and visualize as a reader. Yeah. Um and she runs into these two other people and is like oh, I need to find Harrow. Well, she doesn't say that cuz she can't speak, but the other two people are like, "Okay, she's down there. We'll help you." Mhm. Mm and Gideon's like Big muscle. Just kidding. Yeah. Basically. <laughs> yeah, this them. is... This is... Well, she, uh, Gideon is spying on these two, and it's Palamides and Camilla. Yes. And they are both members of the Seventh. sixth... Seventh house. Wait. Sixth house. Sixth house. You're okay, right. this is what we're talking I'm about. Sorry. <laughs> There's it's so much. Yeah. And I'm on my third listen through and I still have a hard time keeping track of some of these characters. Sixth. I think you're right. It I think sixth. it is the sixth house. Yeah. Palamides Sextus, is that his name? Yes. Okay. Because later on Gideon says <laughs> when she finally talks to him, do you know if you rearrange the letters of your last name, you can spell sex act? No, 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 no. Oh, it's, I get it the wrong. first three letters of both of your names spell sex pal. Sex pal, Sextus that's it. Sextus <laughs> Palamides. That's the first thing that she says to him. 
And it's such a hilarious <laughs> and great reveal. It's so good. Yeah. It's so much fun having your protagonist be the comedic relief. Yes. And for the first, like, second act, or for the second act of the book, she's completely silent. Yeah. And it's not until the third act that she starts revealing what her personality is like. And everyone's like, wow, we really miss that you were, <laughs> your vow of silence. She's like this gigantic hulking woman with a, with a rapier and a metal bone glove and mm -hmm. black skull face paint on and she Very wears robes and hoods and sunglasses sunglasses all the time and then as soon as she talks everybody's like you should keep your mouth shut <laughs> yes it's so much fun yeah it's a great contrast mm -hmm. it makes you wonder what she would dress up as if she weren't raised in the ninth house yeah like who would she be mm -hmm. like how would she present herself yeah um if she were allowed that freedom anyway Palamides is an interesting secondary character because he assumes the role of a traditional protagonist. Yeah. Where he's like honorable. He wants to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, he wants the houses to work together to solve the mystery of the lictors. Yeah. And if and he almost kind of doesn't trust what becoming a lictor really um, entails. Mm -hmm. And he remains suspicious about that. Um, and he always knows what to do. He's very smart. He's very assertive. Um, and I just love that, you know, twist. Yeah. Our secondary character is not really passive. She still makes her own decisions. Mm -hmm. She's very competent, very good with the blade. Mm -hmm. But um, she really relies on other people to make big decisions for her. Yeah. She's kind of really fills the role of bodyguard or being the tank, I mm. guess. Like, she's like, okay, I'll follow along. I'll help. And she is helpful. It's not like she's useless or yeah. not important, but more characters around her make decisions that push the plot forward than she does. Yeah, which is interesting. Yeah. Because she doesn't feel very boring to me. No, no, she doesn't. It, it works. Yeah. I don't know how. Yeah, but it, it does. works. <laughs> I don't know either, but it does. Maybe... Maybe it's because there's so many characters and they're all so interesting. Yeah. And they're all fighting for the same goal too. That yeah. That helps. Yeah, for sure. So it's not like you're just reading along Gideon's journey. You're reading along the journey of Every everyone house. to solve yeah. the mystery of what it means to be a lictor. Yeah. Or, or of how to become a lictor. Yeah. Um, sorry to go on that massive tangent. <laughs> no, I think that's good. But um, when Gideon f walks in on Palamides and uh, Camilla... She, of course, gets into a sword fight with Camilla first thing. Uh -huh. And the way that she describes her sword fights are it's so much so fun. so great. She writes great action, it's too. It's so great. And it's the complete package. Just read this book. Yeah, please Just read it. read this book. It's so good. <laughs> but she and Camilla get into a sword fight. Um, she takes note of Camilla's abilities. She's She underestimated how good she is. Uh-huh. Um, and then Palamides tells Gideon, it's okay, we're looking for your necromancer, but we have to get through this door, which we can't open. And then Gideon tries to yank it open, <laughs> but Gideon's she like, can't. Ah, yeah. Let me in. And Palamides is like, classic cavalier. Yep. It's like, here's how you have to open it up. Oh, I don't remember God, how they no get brains. through there. But. It's with the little metal key that they get in the first place. Okay. That so did they use Camilla's key? key? Yeah. Okay. This is what they use to open this shaft. Mm -hmm. Like... There's a ladder, it's a shaft, and they go in. <laughs> I don't know, but it's, it feels like this This is kind of where the sci fantasy stuff comes in. Mm -hmm. The way that she describes the castle is that it feels like an, a gigantic ancient castle built on an island mm -hmm. um, that you would see pictures of in like Scotland or, yeah. you know, some place like that or mm -hmm. Ireland or whatever. But at the same time, within the castle, there's all this ancient high tech technology yeah like secret rooms secret passageways secret labs yeah there's electric lighting in some places mm -hmm. it's that really brilliant and cool mixture of yeah. sci fantasy it's so fun it's such a light touch but it does give you um the sense that this world that these people live in is ancient yeah it's and it's fun to see the conglomeration between the two and like as the characters go in between these places, it's also interesting because it's like, oh, this stony castle, and then there's this metal shaft in here mm -hmm. with a ladder that goes way, way, way down, and there's 
laboratories and sanitization they find, places. Like, they find an assault rifle and Gideon's yeah. like, wow, I saw, I've only know that because I've read it in my comics. Yeah. Um, this place must be super ancient. Mm -hmm. um, I love those little touches. Yeah, I do too. It's fun when, when authors who write fantasy and stuff or sci, -fan sci fantasy. That's what I'm calling it. Yeah, <laughs> me too. I don't even know if that's what it's called, but it either. makes sense. So I would hope that's what it's called. Yeah. But it's fun when authors put stuff in that we recognize from our time and we'd be like, whoa. It feels so whoa. alien. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's fun. Yeah, it is really cool. I also love that the Cavaliers don't have laser guns. I do too. I like that they have swords. Me too. It's For fun. some reason, that mixture of um, science fiction and like old world technology, like why do they have swords? Yeah. And they're like, that assault rifle, totally useless. Mm -hmm. Ancient technology. I'd rather use a long blade. Yep. She's I'm like, like, I don't care if it doesn't make sense. This is so much cooler. I like it. It's yeah. fun. And I think that a sword would last longer. You don't need to put ammo in a sword. Not that we're debating that, but like, <laughs> yeah. it's 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 fun and unique and I like it. <laughs> yes, that stuff is, I think, setting a good tone, mm -hmm. um, which is what I like. Yeah, I love that So too. it doesn't matter if it makes sense, doesn't matter if it really affects the world building in any other significant way. It doesn't uh -huh. come up in this story. Yeah. Um, people fight with either necromancy or swords. Yeah. And that's, that's the way it, it works yeah. in this world. Um, anyway, Palamides and Camilla. Camilla. I always forget her name. <laughs> Palamides, Camilla, and Gideon find uh, Harrow. Harrowhawk mm -hmm. in some random laboratory in some decrepit ancient area that no living soul has seen except for Harrowhawk. Uh huh. And she's protected herself with this giant bone cocoon. It's gross. It's such great descriptions. Yeah. It's incredible. And she's passed out and has protected herself with, with this bone. She's cocoon. gone into like a comatose yeah. state. Yeah, and Palamides and Camilla. Palamides is like a doctor character almost too. He is very interested mm -hmm. in medicine and medicinal sciences. And he's like taking her pulse and noticing that she's dehydrated. And Gideon is like confused and thinking, mm -hmm. oh, that just need, must be a sixth thing and Palamides yeah. is like oh a medical necromancer there's an oxymoron for you mm -hmm. he's like no I just like science <laughs> yeah <laughs> which is fun I mean they still use the necromancy to find that but yeah but the fact that he's interested in um science health. is cool uh -huh. and yeah. health and medicine yeah um it does give his character more dynamics mm -hmm. he's not just your boring typical protagonist male yeah. protagonist yeah um he has some other parts of it him that make him more unique. He's mm -hmm. not a fighter. He's a researcher. Yeah. Um, it sucks that they make you like Palamides and Camilla so much because you know that Camilla and Palamides are really close. Mm -hmm. They're not romantically close, but they're strong. They have a strong friendship. Yeah. And you just love Camilla too, even though she doesn't have a ton to her character. Mm -hmm. You love that she's a good sword fighter. You love that people underestimate her. Yeah. Um, anyway. I, I really like in this book how as Gideon is going through this trial and observing those around her, she really notices the tight, tight, tight bond that each necromancer and cavalier has. Mm -hmm. And she almost hates to admit that she wants that. Yeah. Like, she observes Pal... Pal... Palamide... Palamides? Palamides. Palamides. Sorry. Palamides and Camilla and how as soon as Palamides is like... Palamides. Camilla, Palamides is like, Camilla, back off. Camilla's like, okay, I trust you. Mm -hmm. And... There's these tight, tight, tight relationships that Gideon is kind of like. That is Harrowhawk's not. Harrowhawk's been doing this alone. Yeah. She I, doesn't trust me at all. Yeah, it's 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 fun as a reader. To yeah. Be like, oh, I can tell she misses that, but she's not. Yeah. Admitting it. And this moment at least when. That's my perception. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, and it's this moment is really important when Palamides and Gideon save Harrowhawk, that we really see a shift in their relationship. Mm -hmm. Gideon brings Harrowhawk back to their rooms. Doesn't really nurse her back to health. She, She's like, what am I supposed to do with her? The dialogue is literally like, do I put the water on her face? Yeah. Do I, do I open her mouth? Do I, what, how do I give her water? And Harrowhawk's like, don't touch me. Just give me some water. Yep. <laughs> um, and let me sleep. Yeah. And then they have this argument. The dialogue's fantastic, of course. And Gideon uh -huh. says, you have to trust me and let me work with you. Yeah. Because you almost died. And Harrowhawk is 
very, very hesitant to admit that she needs Gideon's yeah, help. Yeah, she's like, I didn't die. I was taking a nap. I was fine. I would have gotten yeah. my strength back together and come back. Both Not true. she and Gideon are very scared to admit they're vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe Harrowhawk more than Gideon. Yeah. Because she doesn't want to appear as weak yeah. or needing someone's help. Especially Gideon's help. Yeah. Gideon, who is just a big dumb brawler. Yeah. Doesn't know anything about necromancy. Mm -hmm. And Harrowhawk, Harrowhawk wants to solve all these problems on her own. Yeah. And I love that relationship and that hesitancy to let Gideon help her. Because mm -hmm. she admits, well... In some of these tests, you actually do need the help of your cavalier, mm -hmm. which she is reluctant to admit, but she would never ever let Gideon, like, have some type of input in, like, how you achieve these challenges. Yeah. Or if she did, then she would be really averse to accepting that help. Mm -hmm. It's a good dynamic. It is. It's fun. And as a reader, mm -hmm. you're like, okay, I can see where their relationship is and I can see where it is going to end up, and yeah. I can't wait to travel that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the way that that relationship unfolds makes total sense. Yeah. Like, they don't decide to become friends right away after Gideon saves her. Mm -hmm. It takes a while for them to warm up to each other, mm -hmm. to recognize each other's strengths, to admit when they need each other's help. Yeah. Um, and it's so sweet. It is. It just makes you emotional when you find it's... out exactly why they hate each it's other. It's so... There's just such a great scene. Yeah. There's so many great scenes, but the one where they finally really drop their guards down and talk to each other is just so impactful and heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. You get to hear their history, and Gideon, instead of... Harrowhawk was assuming Gideon would hate her or be upset, and Gideon is like, I'm sorry, and gives her a hug, mm -hmm. and Harrowhawk doesn't know how to have a hug. Yeah. And it's sad. <laughs> it's really like, sad. Gideon's like, I think she thought I was drowning her at first and was fine with the drowning. We didn't until... mention why they're drowning. Oh, they're in a pool. Yeah. It, they're in a pool. <laughs> I never know how much information to give yeah. context for. They're in a saltwater pool of water. It's like a traditional thing mm -hmm. from her family of telling secrets needs to be done in salt water right yes well <laughs> i didn't get to this part of the book on my third okay. listen through so the memory is kind of vague yeah but basically um after harrowhawk and gideon decide to work together after gideon saves harrowhawk mm -hmm. um they work together to solve all these challenges to become a lictor and to collect more keys yes and it's not until like the very end of the book that gideon and harrowhawk have their heart to heart yes and I don't remember how they find themselves at this saltwater pool. Yeah, Harrowhawk takes Gideon and is like, I need to tell you some secrets. It's time for me to tell, it's time for us to lay it all out there. Yes, and at this point, Gideon and Harrowhawk have learned how to work together and trust each other. Mm -hmm. And everyone basically knows that Gideon is no real cavalier. Yeah. Um, but. No one cares. Yeah, because people are dying and being murdered, so they're like, yeah. okay, they're There's more obviously important more. Things. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. We're not worried about, you know, are you qualified to become a lictor or not? Yeah. There is some gigantic, scary thing in the castle that's killing us one uh -huh. by one. Yeah. And so, Harrowhawk and Gideon decide. Harrowhawk decides to tell Gideon some secrets about her family. Mm -hmm. um, and in order to do that, you have to do it. There's some kind of like traditional thing. Yeah. Where you have to do it in a saltwater pool. Yeah. And. It's really touching. It's such a great scene. The character relationships there just go from 100 to 110, in mm -hmm. my opinion. And um, Gideon hugs Harrowhawk at the end of this, and Harrowhawk seriously thinks she's being drowned by Gideon and is fine with the drowning mm -hmm. until Harrowhawk is like, oh, she's trying to hug me. Freaks out. Gross. And Gideon is like... <laughs> I love you, my necromancy <laughs> yes, queen. Yes, yes. And... It's just fantastic. My skeletal haggett. Oh, I think yes. I that's one thing I, she uses to describe her as. The names, the names that Gideon gives her are just incredible. Are hilarious. They're fantastic. I bookmarked a lot of them because I loved them so much. Oh, good. Um, yeah, there's, a, like, Crepuscular Queen yes. is one of them. Um, <laughs> there are so many good ones. Oh, it's just so great. Yeah. Um... I don't know if you want to go over what Harrowhawk tells Gideon about their backstory. I think that's important to cover. Yeah. Because um, I honestly don't remember specifically okay. what happens. Harrowhawk says to Gideon, um, oh my gosh, I feel like I can't remember either. 
Gideon and Harahawk... It's a dense book. It's a dense book, and Harahawk is like, you can ask me anything. Mm -hmm. And Gideon says, why did all of the children die except for us? We probably need to explain that too. Yes. Okay, maybe we don't have to get into this, but there is so much backstory that's important to Gideon and Harahawk's relationship. Mm -hmm. How it first started out. Yeah. Um, and I guess to go over it briefly, Harahawk... Her parents wanted to create the most powerful necromancer ever, right? Mm -hmm. So, is, like, correct me if I'm wrong. No, that's correct. They, her parents had a hard time conceiving, and there's not a sure chance of having a necromancer. So they were worried about that, and there's one way to ensure that your child is a necromancer, and they took that path. And how do you achieve that? By sacrificing and taking the lives of 200 children, and using necromantic magic to ensure that your child, that thanergy is what something in this huge That's world the building magical thing, energy. the magical energy is called thanergy. Yeah. And taking the thanergy from 200 children allows for one uber powerful necromancer for sure. And that's who Nec uh, Harrowhawk that's is. That's how Harrowhawk was created. And Gideon is the only person who they couldn't kill her. She wouldn't die. For, she was in the same room as all those children that were poisoned, um, and she was the only one who survived. Yeah. And we don't know why. Uh-huh. It's... And it, that's that explains why Harrowhawk's parents hated Gideon so much, because they They were feared terrified her. of her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Gideon then pieces that together and is like, oh, they didn't just hate me, they were scared of me. Mm -hmm. All those things that I mistook as just hatred, it was because... What? Newborn can't be murdered by poison gas. Mm -hmm. Anyway. It's also probably why they kept her as a indentured, indentured servant. servant. Mm -hmm. So they're like, uh, we don't know what this terrifying child is, but we have to at least control Keep it close. her. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's really interesting and I loved that. I really enjoyed that. Yeah. I didn't expect that to be the reason why everybody was killed. Yeah, me neither. So. But it's such a good twist and yeah. a reveal well not a twist, but it's a great reveal. Yeah. It's fantastic. Where it's like, ah! And Harrowhawk, she's not a bad person because she didn't choose for her parents to kill all those people. Yeah. All those children. She wasn't born. Uh-huh. But what happens to her parents? Because so, I remember there's a big thing about yes, that, too. Gideon tricks Harrowhawk into opening the locked tomb. The this, locked, this happened in the past. Yes, this happened in the past. The locked tomb is the thing that the ninth house was created to guard. Mm -hmm. Inside this tomb is something that is supposed to kill, like an apocalyptic being that is prophesied, I guess, to kill their god in their world, mm -hmm. the king undying. And Gideon tricked and manipulated Harrowhawk into opening this locked tomb. Harrowhawk when went, they were children. When they were like Seven? Yeah. Ten? Seven to ten? Young, young, young. So I think they were trying to get in there because they were just like being mischievous kids, right? Well... Or was Gideon drawn to it? Gideon Gideon is like, you can't open it, no one can open it, I think. And manipulated Harahawk into opening it. Okay. And... I can't... Yeah. I think that's what happened. I can't remember. And so Harahawk opens this, finds out what's in the tomb, and then... Gideon it's is like... It's this great secret that was supposed to know. It's huge secret that no one's supposed to know. And no one's supposed to open that tomb. Mm -hmm. Their prayers are, the stone is rolled over and will never move. Yeah. Like, and Gideon uses this as she goes and tattles on... Oh. Um, Harrowhawk's Harrow. parents. She goes to her parents and says, Harrowhawk opened the tomb. Um, hmm. You should get mad at her. So it was kind of like a childish yes. thing. Okay. Yeah, it's like, a, yeah. Oh, that's great. She, yeah, and so the parents are like, leave, get out. And so Gideon, they just told her to get out of the room. So she stood outside the room and wanted to hear Harrow's butt being handed to her. Mm -hmm. That never happens. It's quiet, 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 quiet for like an hour. And so Gideon finally goes back into the throne room and she sees that Harrow's parents and Cavalier have been hung. Mm -hmm. They have killed themselves. She walks in and sees Harrow with a <sighs> rope and assumes that Harrow killed her parents. Mm -hmm. um, as a six-year-old. <laughs> as a six-year-old. So That's why she's so terrified of Harrowhawk. That's why she's so terrified of Harrowhawk and why Harrowhawk hates Gideon. Because mm -hmm. Gideon's like, I know that she murdered her parents. Yeah. And Harrowhawk, using necromancy, puppets their dead bodies for the rest of her life. From the, the age of seven. 
<laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. And this is the huge secret that Gideon was use, implying to use his blackmail, mm -hmm. and it's why Harrowhawk is terrifying, and then Harrowhawk confesses that her parents killed themselves and said to Harrow, you've done a bad thing. This is the start of the apocalypse. The only way to stop this is to kill ourselves because no one should know. <laughs> and you have to kill yourself too. Seven years old. And that's why old. she was holding the rope. That's why she was holding the rope. The cavalier did it with no question. Her parents did. Mm -hmm. And she couldn't. Yeah. And she chose, she was like, I am the spirits of the two th 200 children that were killed. Mm -hmm. I can't throw that away. I don't deserve my life. But also, my I life. did do this awful thing. It's just such an it's amazing fantastic. reveal. It's so good. It I totally it. explains the relationship between Gideon and Harrowhawk, mm -hmm. and it sets you up for the sequel so perfectly. Yes. Because it's like, okay, what does it mean that the apocalypse is going to begin? Yeah, yeah. And let's go back to the locked tomb and find out what's inside there. Yeah, and there's this great moment when Gideon and Harrow are, like, leaning in. And they're about to kiss. <laughs> and Gideon's like, are you telling me? So in the tomb is this girl. Mm -hmm. It's like this... <laughs> young girl yeah and harold's like she's the prettiest person i've ever met and gideon's like are you telling me you have the hearts for some old lady mm -hmm. <laughs> it's fantastic end of chapter she ruins it's the great. moment it's of great. course <laughs> it's gideon yes of course she has to make you know silly. make a joke yep. right with as soon as harold hawk is bearing her heart mm -hmm. out to this person who she's hated her whole life yeah it's fantastic it's so good read the book yeah <laughs> Um, there's so much to talk about. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you wanted to talk about anything else, because there's so much we could yeah. talk about, or if we got to all the things that you wanted to mention. I think that's most of what I wanted to mention. I love the character relationships. Mm -hmm. I love how how well the author pieces together this mystery, which you need to read the book to hear the ending. Yeah. Just read it. I don't it's even so want good. to explain it, because it's so fantastic. And... I love the tone. It was mm. so irreverent and fun and spooky. Yeah. And yeah, all around, great book. Yeah. I loved it. I'm so glad. Yeah. Would you say that it's one of your favorites? Yes. Would you say it's one of your favorites? Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay. I don't want to rank it, but it is one of my favorites. Yeah. I love it. I loved it. I think now we'll both have to read further Carol into the, the series. Yep. Yeah. I have it on Audible, oh, at least. Oh, perfect. So. I bought a copy to come in the mail this week. Okay, cool. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, thanks for listening. Next week we will be talking about The Hunger Games, which mm -hmm. is one of my favorite books. And it's, well, I don't want to say. Spoilers. It's one of your favorite books. Just kidding. No spoilers. <laughs> but we can't spoil anything that we haven't made yet. Yep. Well, thanks for joining us. See you next week. Bye. Bye.